Humboldt Bay is the largest estuary uh, in California, north of San Francisco Bay. It's also where about 70% of the oysters produced in California come from. So it's a very rich ecosystem. So when you're living on the edge of a bay, one of the things that immediately is going to be in front of you is sea level rise. So that's one of the areas that we're focused on. So we are focused on, you know, what can we collectively do to understand what changes are going to be coming our way in terms of uh, implications of climate change and sea level rise, and what do we need to do to learn to adapt to those changes. Regulation alone will not solve these complex problems. So offering incentives and encouraging landowners to do the right kinds of best management practices, that in the end is your bigger payoff. Um, you know, trying to go out and create laws and regulations and then enforce them and expect people to respond positively is not a good model. Um, certainly there's a place for it. You need to have that law and order kind of approach on certain issues so people just don't act recklessly. However, I think in the end, it is not the most cost-effective and efficient way to address resource management issues. We have a community here that's a small rural coastal community that depends on economic activity in areas that uh, are, are mostly resource extractive, you know, logging, fishing, tourism, commercial fishing, sport fishing, aquaculture uh, is one of those things that, that, that falls into that. We've invested a huge amount of money to make this bay productive for shellfish. It's only natural to me to promote shellfish in this bay. Shellfish promotes clean water, a healthy environment, a productive bay, which benefits not just the shellfish industry, it benefits the nursery um, activities that happen for marine fish. It benefits fishermen that sport fish. It benefits the hotels that supply rooms for, for the sport fishermen that come over. It benefits England Marine down the street that sells marine supplies. We are, you know, kind of an integral part of that whole big picture. I think there's a lot of good that comes from having a, a, an industry like the shellfish industry in a bay. And, it, and it's not an exclusive industry. We all work together to have um, something of value. Collaboration is its core and central to ecosystem-based management. The other thing is, is that we live in an era of diminishing resources. So you're going to, just by economic necessity, collaborate to get things done. The Humboldt Bay Initiative is a different process than the way we've worked in the past. In the past, we've worked more um, within our agency, in our office, to, to work on resource problems, communicating maybe with one or two other people at another agency. But now, what we're doing through this collaboration is we're working with multiple agencies, multiple stakeholders, tribes, nonprofit organizations. We're communicating in one place at one time. By engaging all those different stakeholders, you make better management decisions. You appreciate both the economic issues that are at risk and at stake, and you have a better understanding of how the ecosystem issues function and how you can you know, accelerate and maximize those two. We're all in this together. There's only one planet, we're all part of it, and we all gotta work together. And that's really, I think, at the core of EBM. We are overlooking Elkhorn Slough, which is the largest tract of coastal salt marsh on the coast of California, outside of San Francisco Bay. So these wetlands and tidelands encompass about 3,000 acres, with another 1,000 acres in Morro Coho, one of the main tributaries to Elkhorn Slough. Extraordinarily diverse habitat. Elkhorn Slough is a working landscape. I mean, you can see this is not a pristine environment. And just about every land use that you could imagine in the coastal zone, save perhaps for logging, is happening here. We have the largest single source of electric power generation in the state of California, located at the mouth of Elkhorn Slough. 2,500 megawatts of power are generated by that power plant. We have the main north-south rail line on the coast of California, cutting through the eastern side of the slough. We have prime agricultural land flanking the slough in the Salinas Valley and the Pajaro Valley, lots of cultivation in the hills, residential development. Moss Landing Harbor at the mouth of Elkhorn Slough is one of the busiest fishing ports in the state. 
And in the middle of all that, in the middle of all this human use, is this extraordinary habitat. We have about one marine mammal per acre of the estuary, about a thousand marine mammals at certain times of the year live here. We have 300 odd species of birds that have been seen in the slough. Birds seen very few other places in North America turn up here for some reason. Uh, 750 species of fish, uh, marine invertebrates, and, and other um, organisms living in the water itself and in the mud. It's just an amazingly rich ecosystem. So we're not managing for a single species. Uh, we're not managing for a single land use. We're trying to manage the whole thing together, recognizing that everything inter interacts. It's a web of life, and it's a web of social and economic interactions. They can't sink, so it's not a problem. They got so much fur on them and hold so much air in it that they float. But the mother will carry it around like that. Then she'll put it in the water. She'll dive, get some crabs. They like this area because it has all that eel grass. As I got involved with the different experiments from water quality sampling to measuring algae to measuring the marsh levels, all of these things feed together. We've lost over 75% of our wetlands here in California. So in this little Elkhorn slough, compared to things that we have on the East Coast or in Louisiana, as you see that, this little seven mile estuary is the third largest in California. Folks here grow lettuce and strawberries and, you know, it's the kind of food where you, you go to the doctor, they say that's what you should eat, right? So no one wants to see that turn into housing or industrial development. People want to see viable farms. So we, we try to partner with the growers and find good ways where uh, for them to continue making food and uh, just reduce the impact downstream. You know, what we're seeing literally all around the world are impacts in coastal areas from adjoining land uses. So the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico caused by over-enrichment by all the nutrients flowing down the Mississippi, winding up in the Gulf. We're finding dead zones off the coast of Oregon. Uh, we're seeing depleted oxygen levels in estuaries around the, the country and around the world. And so this is a zero-sum game at this point in Earth's history, right? So that every change we make, something's going to win, something's going to lose. It's a trade-off. There's no way to get more than we now have. We're just going to shift it. And uh, we're learning how to do that. How do you grow crops? How do you grow them in a way that reduces inputs of nutrients that shifts ecosystems in a negative way? How do you do it so that you're capturing the maximum amount of water, that you're replenishing aquifers where you can, and sustaining their use? So I, I think that's, you know, the whole concept of green infrastructure is really critical to understand why conservation has a fundamental economic and social value. We're standing uh, on the shore of the Morro Bay National Estuary. Uh, happens to be the smallest of all the national estuaries, which range in size all the way up to Chesapeake Bay. And really, with this small uh, magnitude, a small-sized estuary, everything seems to be heightened. All the effects seem to be very much on display, whether it's water quality or sedimentation uh, or uses. So there's, there's a lot going on in a small space here. I think we're in a really interesting time environmental policy right now. That going back into the 60s, uh, the environmental issues from a policy perspective were pretty simple. You'd go to a river, you'd see a pipe disgorging green gunk into the river, you'd say stop that. And uh, uh, eventually regulation could cause that factory or whatever it was to stop discharging into, into those waters. We've managed to do a tremendous amount of that sort of environmental regulation and cleaned up a lot of places, but now we're still seeing that there are issues, whether it's water quality, uh, drinking water quantity, health of natural systems. 
world is getting much more complicated, or certainly the solutions to these problems are much more complicated. And so uh, the kind of science that ecosystem-based management uh, is based on is really central to trying to figure out what a rational approach to solving these more complex problems. Ecosystems have multiple scales. They're, they can be very small, like an eelgrass bed. They can be larger, like the estuary and watershed. They can get larger and be the near shore rocky habitat, for instance, in the subtidal environment. All of those are connected. All of those scales are connected ecologically. And so the management system needs to move across those scales as well. And so for us, it's common sense that you need this ecosystem-based approach that looks at these cumulative impacts and tries to integrate jurisdictions. And then I think the other element that's really important is you have to bring in the people who are affected by the regulations. And you can't ignore their activities, that is a human activity within the ecosystem. You also want them to be a part of whatever, in some capacity, the, the management process. Yeah, I always come back to the fisheries because that's the one that makes better sense at smaller scales for many of the species and communities that fish. What we're learning from the scientific perspective is that these fish don't move around a whole lot. Their populations are very distinct up and down the coast. We know that where communities go to fish is very distinct. It makes sense for us to change the scale to a more ecosystem-based scale of management because that's how the resources scale and that's how the people are scaled. The, the dramatic effect is going to be in the current. This is a way to craft regulation that makes sense and to craft regulation in a way that brings stakeholders together in support of that, of that regulation. I, I think people in general want to do the right thing and uh, if they can understand uh, the basis, the rationale for regulation, I've found that they're accepting of it. We also have to have the incentive side, and so one of the other things government can do is to uh, craft ways in which it makes it easier for folks to do, to do the right thing. So that's a new kind of discussion, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's going to require a shift in thinking in all the stakeholders, whether it's a government agency or an environmental group or a commercial fishing organization. Everybody's is going to have to think a little bit differently. So I think that's where ecosystem-based management comes in. It takes a very wide view, is based on, on, on great science, and uh, provides policymakers uh, the tools that I think are really important uh, as we work on these challenging problems.